next. <laughs> I know. I know. So, um, uh, so second film, uh, this one also involves Kanuyo Tanaka because I really wanted to, actually, this is the one that I picked first. And then at the last minute, I was just like, how would you guys feel about me adding in, um, uh, the life of Oharu basically. So I could also talk about her as an actress. Um, and I'm like, and he was just like, yes, do it. Absolutely. And I was just like, all right, cool. Uh, so I added that one at absolutely the last minute, but, um, this one I'd been planning on talking about, uh, I knew, when we settled on this topic that I really wanted to talk about Kaneyu Tanaka in general, because she was an absolutely groundbreaking female director in Japan and worldwide. Um, so she was very successful as an actress. She was like a absolute, you know, superstar in Japan. Like she was one of those actresses, everybody knew her. And then in 1953, she decided to shift towards directing because she really felt that women in Japan were getting involved in politics and they should also be getting involved in the arts and in filmmaking. Um, and not just by being on the screen, but also being behind the camera, making the decisions, writing the films and all of this. So her first film uh, came out um, in the early 50s. I can't remember the year off the top of my head, but that one was Love Letter. Um, and the one that I want to talk about in more depth is The Moon Has Risen, which is her second film. So this one is interesting because it was actually originally written by um, Yasujiro Ozu, who kind of took her under his wing. Oh. He was like a big, big mentor to her and really supported her um, getting into direction, which is a really cool thing. Um, because the cinema was not very open to women directors at the mm. time. So the fact that he supported her really helped her get her foot in the door with it, which is awesome. You know, good ally. Great. Awesome. All the, Ozu is another. Ozu is yes. the third in that line of women directors. Yeah, women's yeah. He's, directors. he's another one. And, and just the fact that he supported her, too. It's like not only like just, you know, doing good with, you know, portraying women in his films. He's also like, yes, I will give you a boost to help you get this to happen oh, since yeah. that's what you want to do. And it's just, I, I love that. Mm -hmm. Um. And uh, so this was originally written by him and Ryosuke Saito. And so they were they were going to do this film and never quite got green lighted. They didn't use it. And then um, basically Ozu gave Tanaka his blessing to make this film. So uh, so she's directing a film that she didn't write, but it really um, is very much in Ozu's style overall. But because of the kind of feminine perspective of the story, as well as having a female director, the choices that she makes in it kind of shift it more like away from the male gaze and and just kind of going in a different direction with it which i think is a really interesting result um because it's like they're collaborating on it you know it's it's a really cool thing so uh the film overall is really about the situation in post-war japan in general um but whereas a lot of films that were going on at this time in the like you know 40s 50s and so on um were, were kind of dark and kind of like brooding and kind of like everything is weird, culture is changing, technology is changing, what are we going to do, you know, and, and you know, economic troubles and, and becoming more like, you know, quote unquote, westernized. Um, but this film has kind of a more lighthearted um, tone overall. This is a romantic comedy. Uh, mm. which is not even really my favorite genre in general, but I find it so intriguing just literally because of the situation with the director. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be an it. idiot. I'm going to be an idiot because I was oh, doing no. technical stuff here. What's the name of the movie again? The movie is um, the moon has risen. Okay. I've heard of it, but yes. I know nothing about no, you're good. it. Okay. Thank you. I'm you're learning. Good. These things like there. go out of my head all the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, where is I? Uh, so it's it's kind of lighthearted. It's it's tender. It's funny. Gosh, it's really funny. Um, I laughed out loud a few times watching it myself. Uh, there's one line early on. Um, one character asks, like, "Have you ever heard of a microwave?" And he's like talking about microwaves, like the science behind it and everything. It's just like you see this and you realize, you know, this was made in the '50s. This was new technology at the time. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like this came out a little bit before you know my parents were born. Uh, my dad was born in '58. My mom was born in '61. So it's like this is when my grandparents were like the same age as the people in this film. And it's it's bananas. Uh, I I really really love that. Mm -hmm. So 
<laughs> so uh, the, the plot is really, um, it's about these three sisters who live with their father, who's a widower. Um, they all live in a temple together. You get right from the beginning, um, it starts out with this absolutely gorgeous chanting at this temple. Um, so music is a very important part of this film as well. Um, and it, it sets up this kind of like very traditional picture of Japan. Everybody is wearing traditional clothing. The women are wearing these beautiful kimonos um, and all of that and, and the chanting. And then as you get into it, you see the, the characters kind of, some of them still have that traditional dress. Some of them have more, you know, like men wearing suits, women wearing like skirts and blouses. Um, so some of them kind of have that, you know, pre-war traditional look and some of them have the more like okay now there's more western influence look um and so two of the sisters um uh, Setsuko and Ayako really represent kind of those those two diverging directions so Setsuko is um the uh the younger sister and so she is more kind of going in that more like uh more westernizing direction um and then her sister Ayako is is being set up with a bank manager's son and Setsuko is basically like, well, you know, I really don't want my sister to be miserable with this guy that she's supposed to marry just because he's a good person to marry. So she goes off on this plot to basically set her sister up with an old childhood friend from her past uh, who is visiting. And um, that guy kind of represents like, you know, this investment in technology and new ways and new ways of doing things. Um, the mm. option to just be with the person that you're in love with, that you have a chance to fall for and all of that. Um, and what's really right. interesting, what's really interesting about this film is that it really centers, um, like the day-to-day -day lives of women in a way, um, that is, that is really, you know, not being done to the same effect, um, until now. So there's a lot of focus on like domestic life. You see people doing housework. You see uh, women like, you know, greeting people at the door. Um, there's a lot of focus on the female characters relationships with each other in addition to their relationships with the men in the story. Um, and it's it's just like this really intimate, like into their lives um, kind of perspective. And all of that is going on while also the country is having this like enormous cultural shift going on. So uh it, it has this like future oriented and and lighthearted you know we can still laugh we can still take joy in things it doesn't have to all be this you know Human understandably loan. feeling right yeah oh, absolutely our session has expired oh whoa what my what? Zoom session has expired please sign. not on not on my end uh, not on my on end my either end. i don't it's a weird thing it just popped up on mine Hmm. Oh well, ignore oh. me. Are you being recorded still? Well, yes, you are because you're on mine. Yeah. Yeah, and it's recording. No, I I have no idea. You, then I guess All right, we'll good. keep going. Yeah, I I gotta leave in about ten minutes anyway, but no, okay. that's weird. Hmm. Okay. okay. Sorry for the interruption. No, you're good. Uh, Actually, right. that was that was pretty much the end of what I wanted to say. So it was kind of good timing. Hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So that's uh, so. the moon has risen. The yes. moon has risen. Moon has risen. Okay. And what risen. year was that one? Uh, that was 1955. 1955. Wow. Mm -hmm. I uh, I want to talk about uh, a movie that my friend Tim McLean, friend of the show, I have to mention him every time. Uh, <laughs> Shout out to Tim. If he wasn't a curmudgeon, a curmudgeon, he would be part of this because he'd be perfect. <laughs> but um, I'm my film mentor. Uh, so we were talking about, uh, you know, uh, well, not Mizuguchi, but we were talking about uh, Mikio Narusa and um, and uh, uh, Ozu, and uh, he was like saying, "Well, here's the first, here's the best ones to start with," which coincidentally were ones I was thinking about trying anyway, and they were ones I had not seen of theirs. Uh, one of them I thought I had, but I had not. So I wanted to talk about this one called "Wife Be Like a Rose." Yes. Uh, which is originally called Suma Yawara no, ye, no Yo Ni, uh, known as Kimiko in the States. So that's simpler. Mm -hmm. um, but this is 1935. So the print wow. is really, you know, not the greatest. Mm -hmm. But to me, that adds to the aura. It's like you're going through, you know, entering that, ain't, you know, old time, like in silent movies. Now, Japan didn't have sound until a few years after the U S so they had not had sound for long when, when Narusa made movies. 
And Naruto made a lot of fucking movies, and most of them were pretty short, and most of them really presaged uh, Ozu's work in the sense of uh, and Mizuguchi's, uh, who was kind of coming up alongside him, but he really presaged that the idea of yeah, women's movies and also movies that explore like mundane things, like Kalen was talking about things that seem mundane but take on a certain meaning because it's, mm-hmm. you're you're seeing these people's lives and the mm-hmm. way it's filmed it makes it interesting um quick detour i personally think the movie that shows mundane activity in real time too uh and makes it an art form is um jean dielman you know uh by uh chantal ackerman have any of you all seen that mm mm-hmm. Okay, so Sight and Sound amazingly voted it the best movie of all best movie last year of all time. They mm. they finally dethroned oh. Hitchcock and Orson Welles. And I own that movie on, on Criterion, and it is a three-hour movie with Delphine Serig uh, um at, from Daughters of Darkness, of course. And that's what it is. It's it's mm. a, you know, three hours of her life in real time doing mundane things. Uh, and it does have a plot, but you know, you kind of have to just immerse yourself, but anyway, mm-hmm. but the Japanese do it a little bit differently than, than, than Chantal did, but, uh, and they didn't do it in real time. So, uh, yeah, like I said, the name of this movie in, in America was Kimiko. Uh, this was also one of the very first Japanese movies, uh, ever distributed, ever played theatrically in the United States. Mm-hmm. It took till 1935. Some accounts say it was the very first. That was a little contradiction there. Um, but anyway, so Kimiko is basically, uh, just a really wonderful, interesting, fun young woman. And she is, has a really nice, sympathetic boyfriend named CG. And, um, they're kind of talking and that's kind of the frame of the movie and they're just talking on the sofa and then they'll flash back to like what brought them to that part and it's just very it's very intimate it's very like low key it's not like romantic romantic but like they kid with each other and there's this playfulness like two people who really are like in love and in sync and comfortable with each other i thought that was interesting you know to see that domestic kind of thing in a in a in a movie that old i mean when i first saw narissa's movies i was completely blown away you know uh because mm-hmm. I, I was getting into mizuguchi ozu i'm still only partial way there but i knew a lot about him but bill white said all right you got ozu you got mizuguchi have you heard of mikio narusa i said and i've never heard of it he said now that's the next level yes. and he was right you know, it was like, this is like the origin of where um, Japanese, that current begins and, and it flowers. Obviously, Ozu's movies were huge hits, despite the fact that a lot of them were, you know, they weren't exactly action packed or melodramatic or anything. They were low key for the most part. Uh, this movie has a little melodrama. Uh, so keep me, the, the name, it's based on Shinpei. Uh, play uh just translates as two wives the reason is her father uh he left their mother her her mother her mother is a poet named etsuko now that's an interesting side thing is that well, it's not side but it's it's side in that while they're talking to each other and, and recounting the 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 story and the wraparound she'll come in there sometimes and CG, the boyfriend, will be like, ask her questions about poetry. And they just start having this conversation about poetry. And she just starts reeling off some just fucking amazing shit. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm a, you know, I don't know about the translation being perfect, but it's it's some awesome poetry. And uh, that's where her kind of comfort zone is. And, you know, she thinks basically the father abandoned them. So because he ran off with a geisha. So, but that was 20 years earlier. So now our two main characters are about to get married. And Kimiko's like, I really would like my father to come. And I really want to get him back together with my mother. 
you know, simple impulse. So uh, she travels to see him and um, she's been receiving money from him every month. And that's that's that. But that's all. Um, and she's going to be able to go to college. It's going to be paid for. So, you know, she's going to be, uh, you know, in like the middle class of in Japan, you know, not not she's going to be a step above. Now, her father, she finds out actually is uh, in and of himself impoverished. He has been <laughs> he has had different jobs and he quit them to search for gold in this area that near where he lives, where there's these mountains. And he really believes that he's going to strike gold. He doesn't particularly seem like he's crazy. Um, It seems like it might almost be plausible, but it might take him a long time. He's already like 50, you know, or so. And he's comfortable with that, you know, with people thinking he's a nut. And Kamiko's like, yeah, but, you know, you left and mother thinks this. And and he's he's not, you can tell he doesn't really, what he says is, your mother is, is, you know, as a poet and as a person, like basically says, your mother is brilliant. She's a fine woman. I, I'm just a good guy. I'm not on her level. I never was. I'm just of the earth, basically. Well, speaking and that's of the, people who think I'm think they're a nut, I'm a nut because I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I well, gotta I, I gotta I gotta go see see the little grand new grandbaby for a little bit yeah. tonight. So I gotta cut. Sorry, out. buddy. Yes, everybody in the <laughs> but, comments <laughs> say congratulations to Keith yay. for becoming a grandfather. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. and everyone but, subscribe, please, and uh, hit the like button. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> uh, and I'll have to check back in after <laughs> afterwards to find out about Bill's second one. So. <laughs> Oh my anyway, god. Yeah, you can check back in. Yeah. Y'all uh anyway, y'all have fun. Okay. Take care, man. All right. Thank you. Bye, okay. All right. So, you know, basically uh Kimiko learns that Oyuki, who is her father's uh wife, so he's a bigamist. He never really divorced his first wife. And you know, he's he he's like, oh well, you know, he's not callous, he's just He's a simple guy. And, uh, you know, Oyuki was a geisha, uh, but she became like a seamstress and a haberdashery and, you know, anything to do with, you know, clothing and crafts. She has her own little shop. So she supports the whole family. They had two children together. So um, our, I guess those are considered illegitimate, but they never use the, any terms like polygamist or illegitimate at all in the movie. They pretty much let you you know, make your judgment on what he's, what done uh, with the two wives thing. And the kids are kind of like mystified because the kids are half sister, but they're, you know, they keep being told by Oyuki, you'll know about this when you're grown up. Hmm. And they're like, oh, we're sick of hearing this. And so Kamiko gets to know Oyuki and Oyuki's like, you know, I've been sending you the money. Uh, and, and not only that, but she's my daughter. Uh, I had a fund for her to go to college and that's where you got your college fund. And she's like, but you've never even met me before. And you would have every reason to dislike me because my mother hates you. And she's like, I'm just not that kind of person, you know, and I, I'm, I don't care if my husband strikes gold or not. Uh, and she, she sits down in one scene and she's just like, it is the four of us. And this is our world and we are at peace. And I was like, oh, it's so incredible. And so Kamiko has changed. She's like, I was wrong. You know, my mother poisoned my opinion of, of, of something she doesn't really know about, but kind of with good reason, since there was no real divorce. Kamiko comes back. She drags the father back. And his family is like, you're never coming back, right? You're going back to your original wife. He's like, no, no, I'm coming back. And he's real tormented about it. And he, I don't think he's he ever considers going back to the first wife. But I think he's he's really he's worried that his family's worried. And, you know, he, he's just a very thoughtful, empathetic kind of guy. So they go to the wedding. Everything's cool. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, he says, I'm going back. And Atsuko kind of 
in a non very not very poetic way kind of loses their shit i mean and not it's not melodramatic but her brother does lose his shit and it's melodramatic and he he is like this will not do no this is not against our tradition and our fucking morals you know this will not stand he's gonna stay um and kamiko's like kamiko knows the truth and they start slandering Oyuki and saying all this shit about him and being going there and being a bum. And Kamiko starts to say, yeah, but that you don't know about. And then the dad's like, and she's like, okay, father, I will remain silent. And so they go, they get a cab and Kamiko sees off her father. And it's really sweet. Um, the father gets to the cab. And the crazy brother-in-law just runs after him to beat his ass, but the cab's already gone. So, you know, once again, no action in an Arusa movie. Um, so, <laughs> basically, uh, that's what the le- what the lesson I've learned. I've read the lesson of the movie is, but I mean, it's easy to glean and it's simple. Is that you know, okay, so life goes on, and that's a, a lesson that Ozu constantly r- arrives at is. Okay, so these things have happened to these characters and their lives have changed, some for the better, some for the worse, but what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I thought this movie was br- br- brilliant. I thought the lead actress, uh, I don't remember her name, who played Kamiko, um, she is uh, amazing. Uh, and I recommend, this is, uh, well, again, friend of the show, Tim said, and he wanted me to tell you guys this actually. If you want to start with Narusa, start with Wife Be Like a Rose. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, it, 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 the fact that it played in America uh, and became a hit with that kind of mood, uh, that's kind of cool. And I think it's mm-hmm. because the lead actress is so likable and you can just use her cool name as the title. And just you know, marketed you know on down on the down low. I don't think it made a lot of money, but that's still mm-hmm. groundbreaking. So, um, uh, anyway, by the way, Kamiko's uh, actress is Sachiko Ch- uh, Chiba. What's her name? Sachiko Chiba. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's here. Thank you, thank you. I yep. didn't see it. I just pulled it oh, up because I figured. You thank know, you. I, can <laughs> I appreciate it. Yes. Okay, Bill, go for it, bro. Okay. Um, right. Well, you know I love cats. And yeah. uh, the Japanese have done a lot. I mean, Jap- Japanese like cats too. Cats are a like big thing there. And ghost cats are, are very cool. I've always loved the idea of ghost cats. I do not necessarily believe in ghosts. I am very open to the possibility. I'm open to any possibility if it might actually, if it's spooky, all the better. Um, <laughs> but I will watch. say like after, you know, when you have a lot of cats, you also have a lot of ex cats, former cats, dead yeah. cats. And there have been weird times when a cat passes that we felt something to have walked across the bed, but all the living cats were accounted for. And then, of course, they do that freak out thing where all the cats will just all look at one corner of the room and you're like, (laughs) what the hell? Yes. I'm looking, I'm looking, I see nothing. And I don't know if they're just fucking with me or what, but yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's even creepy when you have one cat and they just start freaking out. And it's just yeah. like, what do you see that yeah. I do not, sir? You need to tell me. Like, got, they I've, do see things we don't see. Yeah. Yeah. I have a wonderful, wonderful script for a short movie, a short story movie. And oh. the reason I will never make it is that it requires that I have a cat that does certain things on command. So maybe if CGI <laughs> animation starts improving, I'll be able to make a go of it. But anyway, they, the Japanese, um, or you could have a puppet. They, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like a really, really good looking puppet. <laughs> you know, I, listen, I love uh, let the right one in, but that scene with the CGI cats takes you right out of the movie. Cause you're like, Oh no. Mm-mm. That CGI is the worst thing. It's the worst. It's and it's hard because we all know what cats look like, and when you see CGI, but it's the story, Bill. Come on, you're sorry. To lose yourself. Hey, here you go. Black Cat Mansion from 1958. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, this and this is directed by. Do, 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 Isn't it Fukasco? Nobuo Naga Nakagawa. Oh, it's the guy who did Jigoku. Jigoku. The first horror movie. Yes. And Ghost of the Snake Woman. You know, so yes. he, he did he did stuff that would be considered folk horror. And and when yes, you know when you yes. talk about folk horror, 
a lot of times people don't um don't think of the japanese ones where there's a lot of good stuff you know which you is a travesty sh- japanese like folklore uh, is so no, right so, so good now in fairness a lot of these are hard to find or at least they have been until recently youtube mm-hmm. is turning which is YouTube also a travesty turning out to be well, the place where uh, culture is being rescued and you need well, well i was gonna say um bill shutter and the arrow channel both mm-hmm. have yeah, uh, yeah a lot of the yokai movies and yes, the green okay you probably know all this but anyway, i've also no, been no, able no. to find some good stuff on internet archive actually which is where yes. i found mm-hmm. um i mean it's not like folk horror but both of the films that's how you I guys have. help me find I'm those ones i tend to but find no. internet inter- internet archive doesn't always have the best quality but they do not have always. something they do have something youtube doesn't have very much of films that in no way shape or form are supposed to be downloaded and yet there they are so um <laughs> golden voyage of sinbad looking right at you um yes <laughs> but listen folks and if you're listening to this download everything you can because it will all disappear and it only, will. only those of us with hard copies will be able to enjoy these things hard copies are coming back despite they the, are uh, they absolutely are yeah like, bill we'll, gates we're so excited they... about streaming streaming and now streaming is like going to shit so it's like wow well, <laughs> yeah but don't 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 put it past them to start don't count on it finagling yeah. with it and it's like was this always in color no it wasn't um I thought they Looking were smoking. at you, George Lucas. <laughs> yeah, I thought, they were, I thought they were smoking in this scene. Oh, we took all that out. It's like, hey, the thin man without smoking and drinking is not the thin man. Come on. <laughs> I love um, the thin man. I love them. Oh, so ahead of their time. Okay, Black Cat Mansion. So <laughs> this one is kind of cool. It's it's a black and white movie at first where uh, a doctor and his wife, she's got tuberculosis, so they move out to the countryside because that's all the cure we had back then. And um, she starts seeing weird things, a murder of crows, cats walking across the street, a creepy old woman who disappears. None of this alarms them. They are like white folks in an Amityville horror movie. They sign the mortgage. They are not moving out. I don't care what happens. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so they're staying there. She has dreams of cats. And um, eventually they decide that they need an expert. So they go to a Buddhist temple and there's a, chatty kathy priest there who tells them the whole history of the mansion and we flash back to the uh sengoku period this is um mm. the 1400s i guess it's it's way back when and um now amazingly the film becomes color this is the only movie i know of where the modern stuff is in black and white and when they go back in time it's in color and pretty nice really color. cool yeah oh, yeah that's, that's cool. kind of it's sort of neat and uh, we are introduced to Lord Ishid, Ishid, Lord Ishidu, who is, and I mean, there's, we could do, I think we should do a whole episode on our, the most unlikable characters that we've ever come across in film. Oh, oh I'm fun. writing that one down. Yeah. All right. Yes. Un- not right. not, that not evil. Less. Not evil. No. Unlikable. Yes. yes. Terrible. Car- you know. It's like okay, Lord Voldemort is is a is a genocidal mass murdering monster, and yet it's Dolores Umbridge who I absolutely despise. Right. I oh no, understand. that's because it's fucking personal with that. It bitch. is like, personal. <laughs> we've all had a teacher like that that's at right. some point. <laughs> you are never, go- God willing, you are never going to run into a Voldemort. But the yeah. next time you go to you know to renew your license at the dmv <laughs> you're gonna run into dolores umbridge and you're not wrong no, no doubt anyway uh this guy is definitely one of the biggest jerks in japanese cinema maybe in all cinema lord ashida <laughs> and before we even meet this guy we run into a bunch of perfectly nice people who keep reminding each other watch out because lord ashida has a really bad temper that's literally the first thing out of everyone's, you know, hey, nice day today. Yeah, boy, I sure hope this doesn't upset Lord Ashido. You know what a hothead he is. It's like, oh, yeah. Everyone, as soon as you get in there and then we meet him and oh, yeah, they're 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 playing it easy. So there's this guy who's been sent there to teach him how to play the game Go. And I think I've played the game Go, but I, I don't think I played it right because it didn't strike me as something that was that difficult to understand. But then after watching this, I said, maybe I got to look this up. And I looked up the Wikipedia page and, oh, my God, this game is really difficult. It's just it's just white stones and black stones and you flip them over. But, oh, no, no, no. It's like this is this is not checkers. This is really complicated. 
And Lord mm-hmm. Ishidu is not particularly good at it. Uh, uh, neither am uh, I, I realize. But the difference is, I don't turn into a big whiny man baby with a samurai sword when I lose at go. <laughs> but Lord and not just because you don't have a samurai sword. Right? I, well, that's that's part of it, and I just don't care. But he really does, <laughs> and uh, he tries to cheat. And the, the guy is, even though he's been warned, this guy's been warned. Listen, you're going to let him win, right? Because the aforementioned bad temper is like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to let him win. I'm not stupid. Everybody knows what a, what a jerk this guy is. But he's so incensed that he would cheat that he just, you know, stands up. It's like, I'm not going to stand here and be cheated. And so uh, the Lord, proving everyone absolutely right, kills him. Just murdered a guy who was sent here by like the Shogun to teach him to play this idiotic game, and he just <laughs> killed him. Definitely a no no. This is where you're going to have to slit open your belly. So he blackmails one of his retainers into hiding the body behind the wall. Good thinking there. The walls are made out of paper. Everyone knows that they're made. Out of, the The worst place to hide a decaying, decomposing body would be a wall in the 14th century of Japan. But yeah, this uh, ain't this ain't Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah, yeah. And you think, oh well, this, this guy couldn't get any worse. But no, because <laughs> the, the the guy's mom shows up and and she's like she knows what what the score is and she accuses him to his face. Okay, not the best move, mom. He uh, he tries to assault her. And um, he sexually assaults her. So she kills herself and tells her cat to avenge her and then <laughs> dies. And the cat licks up her blood. I'm like, well, we know where this is going. As they do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then um, th- we introduce to the son of this awful guy who somehow must have inherited all of his mom's good genes because this guy's really, really nice. So we know mm, this isn't going to end well. He wants to marry this girl, but she's not quite up to the Lord, uh, you know, Ishii's uh, standards here. Uh, so then he tries to sexually assault her. The son comes in. There's a big fight. He starts kind of doing a Macbeth thing where he sees the ghosts of the people he's wronged, which is literally everyone he's ever interacted with in his entire <laughs> life. And uh, everybody dies. So, so he has just, everyone dies. He has destroyed his house, his family, everything because he sucked at go, you know, Jesus I mean, Christ, you know, battleship. Sure. Uh, but go, come on. And, and th- <laughs> then we go back to the, to the present time. And we realize that, that this is um, the spirit, you know, some, someone's spirit, the ghost spirit, the ghost cat, I guess is, is um, I don't know, going after this poor woman. I think she, maybe she's related to somebody. I, I kind of forget what it's all about, but they, they reach into the wall, pull out the skeleton and um everything's fine and and then it ends with them adopting a cat the, adopting a cat which i love cats but i don't know given given what's been going on in this i house, wouldn't trust that uh yeah that's I don't not know. a good time to adopt a cat now yeah but uh it's pretty cool and and i love that there's some scenes internet connection is unstable well we'll see Uh-oh. yeah we'll see uh there's some there's also some scenes in there where a a monster cat werewolf well no it wouldn't be a werewolf a werecat shows up. <laughs> yeah and it's it's kind of like you know someone from the movie cats only only it's way better and I was about uh, to say, are, are we talking like the movie cats or are we talking like the broadway cats yeah more like the broadway cat things. you know it's like and she tears the throats out of a couple people it's it's pretty cool yeah. It's yeah. this is a this is a fun little little movie. I really yeah. enjoyed it. And right at my darkened alleyway. Yeah, and it's got <laughs> it's got a happy end. I mean, boy, the happy ending is just like I don't know. I think they were trying to make up for all the people who were depressed watching Kalen's film, and they just say, "Here's a here's come on, here's a kitten here. Everyone go home with a smile on your face." Cute cats. <laughs> yes, watch the cute cat movie. Oh, you know. <laughs> One thing I realized watching a lot of these is um, just how much. You know, Japanese culture is very, uh, you know, respect for authority, respect for the past, all this. But when you look at their movies, most of the time, the samurai are terrible people. And they were, (laughs) which I'm sure they were. And and the uh, people who are in charge of the samurai are make the samurai look great. Yeah. Most authority is corrupt. Mm -hmm. Um. Bill, oh, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, it's just it's, it's just interesting to me. You know, if yeah. you compare it to like our our version of the samurai would be like the cowboys, right? And, and um, 
you know, it, it and we glorify the shit out of black cowboys. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's just it's interesting it's interesting looking at the, at the different attitudes and i was like boy you know they they really they look at the past way grimmer than we do but mm-hmm. then again but then i think about it, it's like well but then again the usual cowboy movie is the cowboy who's incorruptibly good comes into a town and the town <laughs> is being run by a bunch of just awful people everyone's being you know abused by by the landowner the boss the who whatever and well, here comes clint eastwood or frank yeah. Nero or somebody yeah, yeah. so <laughs> i feel like uh going off of what you're saying about like japanese culture and like being very like honoring the past and all of that but also having kind of this like anti-authoritarian bend in a lot of media um from what i've seen with a lot of Japanese cinema, including like, you know, live action films that we've talked have talked about, including like animes and all of that, um, and including video games as well. Cause I, I think of video games as kind of like an interactive cinema almost. Like mm-hmm. it's it's a whole nother thing. It's coming I that about. way. Whole nother thing I'd talk about. Uh there's there's like there's that culture of like um like respecting tradition, but there's also just as much of a culture of um being subversive. You you get both. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's something mm-hmm. that comes out of very, very rigid cultural situations. If people are like really, really forced to conform, you also have all these freaks over here who are just like, no, we're gonna do our own thing. Um and you know, you also oh, see that in like Victorian times and you know, today in the United States, like with people, you know, raging against like queer people, you know, there's there's this whole big cultural thing pushing against that. Um so I, I think that, you know, I I definitely see that as a thing that comes up a lot in Japanese cinema. Just um there's there's kind of both. There's the traditional and there's the okay push against it. Well, they make some of the most extreme uh genre movies on earth. Yeah, I'd say the most come out of Japan. I mean, Italy in a, in their day definitely, mm-hmm. you know, let the blood flow. But the Japanese, especially in the cyberpunk era, uh, yeah, I mean, come oh, on. Oh God, the cyberpunk. It's so some, some wild, cruel shit. I mean, some of it I like. Mm-hmm. Some of it I, you know, but some of it's, you know, a lot of it's gross. Um, but it's interesting <laughs> because it's festering under the surface of that proper society. Mm-hmm. So the, I mean, it, the art, the art is always going to rebel. You know, look, look at Florida. Mm-hmm. Florida is one of the most conservative states. Death and metal everyone began, I know from Florida is just like going to fight it. And I mean, death I have metal, family, lots of family death, in Florida. Death metal was born in Florida. And, I didn't know that. That is super, super cool. Yes, the well, band like, Chuck Dildner. And then, of course, the two live crew who had all those uh, censorship issues. That was some, some of the first hardcore rap came out of Florida. It's just, you know. Well, it's like if you go to Salt Lake City, uh, there's the mm-hmm. punk scene there. The punk scene there is pretty cool. It's it's still there, for one thing. It, it's like, wow, this, yeah. is, this is like going back to the 80s here. I got skateboard punks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty neat. <laughs> But they have something <laughs> to rebel against, and and that that yeah. helps. Mm-hmm. I find that there's a lot of really good like counterculture in Atlanta as well, because um, oh, yeah. you know, like in Atlanta, it's like I I live in Metro Atlanta, right? Um, a little bit on the outskirts of it right now. I'm I'm mm-hmm. in kind of a bit of a smaller town at the moment, but um you know like i grew up here and there's like around the city it's like it's it's this like haven of like really resistant culture and you know like we talk a lot about like the civil rights movement and all of that history here um and it's like a queer like haven it's a haven for black people in the south it's it's a lot of these things and like the culture that comes out of atlanta is really unique and especially because it's like this hub in the south in particular and so yeah we're getting off on so many tangents and, I'm sorry. and I yeah how far and, and, this has and yeah and i was like i need to shut up no 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 no, no. no.